let's start from something that I think it's, um, as we said, I mean, to show the films in this way, also make some elements more clear. And maybe one of this progression from this uh, cries for the first film to this voice that most of the time in Bernadette is something you found already. I mean, it was um, um, object trouvé, something you find in the archive and you collected and you re-edited, to something here that is uh, very much written by yourself, I guess. Uh, and there is a moment in Bernadette uh, in which we see a, sh a small caption about the title of the book, uh, and we are hearing something that I think it's from the book, but not all of it, it's from the book. And I think this is a moment which, uh, it's a moment of a passage between Bernadette and this film, I mean, where the, the writing comes in. Could you tell us a bit about this progress and and how you work uh, uh, on writing something so dense like the one what we just heard in, in It For Others? I mean, I think the first thing to say, the, the decision to, um, I mean, the reason why the film is kind of an essay film, as it is, is because the, the, um, the main reference and starting point for the film, the thing that it, it re responds to first is um, Chris Marker and Alan Renee's film, Statues Also Die. So um, aesthetically, th those are the kind of parameters um, so that's what I, I was keen to, to um, uh, you know, to have that continuity throughout. Although it does, I mean, obviously the first section of the film does deal with that, deals with with the issues brought up in that film. But then, as the as my film it for others uh, goes on, it kind of expands uh, socially and and historically. Um, I mean, I think the the it. I mean, I did write it, but. Um, to to a large extent, it is also a collage of of other texts, and I think the process for writing in this film, in particular, was to try and um, take take these different kind of sources, like uh, textually different kind of sources, and to make them um, not not to homogenize them, but just make make it coherent somehow, and then also. I mean, I think the the voice, uh, the female voice does have another purpose, which is to, I mean, I had um, in mind, like from the outset, that it would be a sort of episodic film, so it would switch between, so from the first section and then into the part that um, Michael Michael Clark choreographed, the kind of God's eye view of the dancers. So the the uh, the voice and, and you know the voice comes in after that, but it does it's a point of continuity um, between these quite again like texturally different sections. I mean, with Bernadette, it was it was some somewhat similar. You're right. There there is um, uh, like at the very beginning of that final section, the film's kind of bookended in a way. So the 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 early part of the film where um, where she doesn't speak and then she does speak so it's kind of more familiar sort of archival material and then the white screen at the end so at the very beginning of that section um, it does quote from her autobiography um, but kind of only briefly I mean there's um, and and the rest of it um, the rest of it I wrote myself um, but it was I mean I think the thing um I mean, I I did. Uh, I, I was never in touch with Bernadette McAlisky making the film, but I I did meet her after, and we did this basically. We did it was uh, the film was shown at a film festival in Belfast, and um, it, we we did a Q and A after, and I think that it did kind of um, it it came to the fore again. You know this. Uh, because at the at the time there was a, a feature film which was a sort of biopic which was in the offing about her, and which she vehemently objected to. And what she objected to, I mean, there was two things mainly that she objected to. First of all, was this sort of idea that, I mean, at that period, like from the, say, the early seventies up until about nineteen seventy four, where she became quite marginalised in the Republican movement, and then. There was an attempt to assassinate her uh, in the early 80s, 
and it is almost as if she died then but she didn't and so and and but there is people have a lot of difficulty kind of reconciling that really sort of iconic Bernadette Devlin and you know as you see in that footage I mean she did uh, you know have a genuine mandate for a popular revolution at a time and it seemed that she could she could carry that and then very quickly that went and it's very difficult for people I think to reconcile that really iconic um, image of her with you know as she became more marginalized politically but then sort of withdrew or not not withdrew but um her focus was much more local and it was much more on like for example what she does now she works with migrant agricultural workers in her county and there's a lot of um I mean, the big issues for them are that they don't speak English, so they can't represent themselves. So she kind of provides um, advocacy services for them. Um, so this is a very long way of saying that uh, I didn't want to um, make a film which um, came across as being in any way kind of comprehensive or conclusive, that, it, you know, in any way sort of summed her up. So that was really the, the, the impetus behind... Um, the writing in that final section of the film and, and really so that the film would unravel as opposed to kind of build up to any sort of conclusion or to, you know, achieve any sort of closure. Please, microphone here in the middle. If you raise your hand, yeah. Thank you. Um, when when you were conceiving of the the last film, it, uh, it to others, and then working on it, did you ever imagine it being shown in this kind of context and the the sort of layeredness that occurs um, even more when when viewing it at Art Basel in this sort of VIP screening with with you talking to us? Um, maybe not quite this context, but. Yeah, you're right. It does kind of have, um, uh, particularly the final section of the film, does have a particular resonance here. You know, it's sort of reflecting on um, the film's stat, you know, um, condition as an object, and an object is which is um, circulated and bought and sold. Um, but, I mean, I the, the film was originally um, commissioned for the Scottish Pavilion, at the Venice Biennale. And I think, I mean, they're not quite the same, but there are a lot of the same um, kind of forces at play at the Biennale. So um, that that was kind of in my thinking specifically for that presentation. But I mean, for example, the film's been shown quite a lot at um, film festivals. So that section doesn't have the same resonance there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, in terms of the, the, I mean, when I was making the film, I was really thinking about it being shown at Venice and there wasn't really anything on the table. So that was the kind of, um, uh, that's, that's the sort of resonance that I had in mind. Um, but you know, it's, it's sort of changes according to the context. And, uh, most of it for others, uh, it's built on this association, these ideas that uh, open some new links, some connections uh, between the visual, the structure of the film, the voices, the content. Uh, um, I was wondering um, how much this is representing your own work, or your own way of working and researching and moving like by and linking different ideas that you have, or what you do to prepare a piece like this is much more linear in a way and then you reassemble things and elements in order to provide us as viewer a different kind of experience uh, than the one you had like working on the film i mean this uh, there is a linearity behind this that then gets reassembled or mm -hmm. this is represents very much the way you you research the piece the way you read stuff uh, the way you search for pictures footage uh. yeah i mean i think it's uh, like um I mean, I did really start 
uh, with this film with statues also die, and I think that the, um, I mean, the, one of their central arguments, or maybe the central argument that that Mark and Renee um, make in the film, is that they link the death of certain traditional art forms from West Africa with their commercialization and consumption by the colonial classes uh, at the time. Um, and But I, I suppose it was like a process of kind of taking that, like, because that, that argument can be sort of reduced and applied to a lot of, of other situations. Um, and I, I think that's kind of what I did. I mean, it was that sort of... Um, uh, I think between all the different sections of the film, there is some idea of value and how values kind of assayed or, um, um, you know, that that's really, that's, that's the link between the different sections of the film. I mean, in terms of the process, it's a little bit, I, I think um, there is a, um, a large degree of improvisation with that. I mean, I did have roughly speaking like an idea of of this of a film that was kind of episodic but it wasn't really until um until i got into the process of researching but also making certain parts of it that that kind of um opened opened up you made them in the order we are seeing them or uh, how that influenced in case the way you no they weren't no they were um i mean the the um the stuff with the with the masks and and statues the african masks and statues um that was kind of shot over quite a long period of time um but yeah it, it sort of jumps around a bit but um there there was um the worst there were sections which got added you know in the in the process of of production and the uh the um, the text uh, over the first chapter, the mask chapter, is uh, am, am I right if it's partly directly from the film by Marker and René? There are some parts that are quoting directly and some other that are added by you or from other sources. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it it does like I haven't really added. I mean uh, well, I mean other than the the issues of. Um, I, I suppose kind of neo-colonial um, issues like to do with where the objects are housed and, and the issue of repatriation. Um, but other than that, basically all I've done is kind of reprised um, the arguments that they made in the film. But, it, it, you know, in the process of that, I did go back to Presence African, which is the, the journal which commissioned the film in the first place. And it is really obvious from... Uh, like going into back into that material, how much Mark and Renee also owe, um, you know, there there are um, large parts of their argument which, which they've taken from that, but I think that was that that's the that sort of um, uh, kind of cultural milieu at the time because it was um, between like the certain French intellectuals like um, Jean Paul Sartre, for example, was. Uh, he was one of the patrons of Presence African, and he did bring a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, analysis or methods of analysis to bear, and and kind of introduced them into the magazine. He was he was also um, very interested in the Negritude movement, um, and he wrote he wrote that famous essay of Black Orpheus. So. The, these these were the things that were kind of swirling around. And I did go back into that, and maybe that's I guess the only thing that I've added. But um, it's sort of implicit in the film. Anyway, in uh, statues also die. Anyway, first here in the and then we go. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I remember seeing the film in Venice. And you, you actually had to go through the original film. And I understood that it was the way it was supposed to be, or at least planned at the beginning. Then I would like to know why did you change? Why, why now you show it without the original one? Because from all you're saying, it's like very important. It, it was, you really got the feeling in Venice that to understand your film, you should have seen the other one. 
and now you just show you're without the other one. So was it because it's easier to distribute or to make it circulate or? Not, not necessarily. I mean, I think uh, the the reason why it, it, was, it was this kind of procession. So when you went into the space, um, statues also die, would begin and end. And then a, there was a, a slight kind of delay. Mm -hmm. And then my film would begin after that. I mean, it in thinking about it in advance, it seemed really important to have the two sitting in proximity to one another, you know, and that one would inform the other. But actually, practically, there was a lot of, um, there's a lot of practical difficulties with that, like to do with language. And I couldn't get other, uh, the only way I could, I could show, or have shown um, an English subtitle version of Statues Also Die um, was to have a 35 millimeter projector running. That's the only um, print that exists that has English subtitles on it, which was kind of prohibitive in the situation. Um, so, like the the proximity of one to the other, it really you know you there was a very kind of specialized audience that could really process the two. But all, I think it was also like just seeing them next to one another and then seeing it for others uh, separately. Um, because I think, you know, and just in terms of what I was just saying, like the first section of the film does pretty comprehensively reprise um, the arguments that they've made in the film. So the uh, statues also die as a kind of an object in my film as well. So, um, I mean, you know, I think it can, it can be shown both, um, but, you know, having seen them together and having seen them separately, I think it can exist on its own. Can you, yeah. Thank you. In um, both last new movies, you you bring up um, engage or you you do them with an engagement with a political engagement, even probably I guess. Um, but both movies don't get me out of my seat or excite me in that way. Like, I've, I don't feel really that um, anger or surprise or, or whatever it could be as a, as, a, as a way to start a movie, making movies like this. Um, don't get that far. What, is there a reason for that? Is that you? Or is that even the way that, that the reason that it's commissioned by, by or, organizations part of that? No, I mean, there isn't any, um, I mean, in both films I had more or less complete freedom um, to, I mean, I, I mean, in a way I'm glad you said that, that you're not jumping out of your seat because um, I do, I think it's it's a problematic thing. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with films that are contingent and that are um, sort of... Um, you know, intended to provoke a very particular response. It's just not really what I'm interested in doing, you know, in terms of, because I think there, there's a lot of kind of nuance in terms of representation uh, in both films that I'm equally interested in. It doesn't preclude the political and social issues. I don't think, I, I just think it's far more complicated than that. In this regard, uh, I, I watched yesterday The Status Moranci, uh, and um, I watched it again yesterday, and uh, I was uh, surprised because first I, I saw again your film yesterday, just to prepare this evening, and then I watched again uh, Le Status Moranci. And uh, the second part of the film, the one you're not referring directly here, it's... Um, it's very much speaking to his own times. I mean, it's uh, the film was made in 1953, and uh, the film involves colonialism and racism, which is also part of the mask part. But then also it goes in, I mean, they're talking about uh, workers' rights, uh, sport, uh, um, the grown of a new petit bourgeois after the Second World War. There is a number of uh, political discourse in it, and it's finished with the 
two words that I was uh, very impressed by. It's uh, future and promise, uh, which you also quote. I think you quote the word promise in, 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 in the film, which I was thinking there are two words that, I mean, you would hardly hear nowadays. I mean, this, these two words, they, means this, they really mean that this film was speaking to the time when it was made of uh, the, the, the context, the political context, the social context of change, and it was advocating for some change to happen. How do you feel about that? I mean, you lack that maybe political uh, context around this film. How you see this film speaking to its uh, time, thinking about the way this Lester Tumoran was here and Marc and René were mm -hmm. speaking about the, their times when they did it? Yeah, I mean, I think it uh, like it is a very unusual film, particularly for Chris Marker to end so optimistically. Because, um, like, if you look at like, for example, when he returns to West Africa and Saint Soleil, and to to Guinea Bissau, and Amalcar Cabral, um, and it's, I mean, it isn't cynical, but it's very, um, it's quite disillusioned, you know, or or. It's very deadbeat, you know, um, and you know I have similar feelings for, I mean, the movement that Bernadette Devlin was part of. Um, they're now at least a part, a component of that is um, uh, in government right now, and um, they're like, like beyond the pale shadow of the kind of potential and promise that that, you know, that they originally kind of, um, you know, when they originally kind of emerged, that that sort of um, seemed to be possible. So I, I think it is like, that. it's just the, the um, uh, quite disappointing reality of that, of how that's, of that evolution. Um, obviously, when you're making films with found footage, you're sort of updating something historical for a contemporary um, mindset or view or whatever. But I notice in the f pieces that we saw tonight, there's a through line specifically of colonialism or oppression. Um, and I wonder if that's coincidental to these two pieces or is it more of an overarching theme in your work? A personal preoccupation or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, it does. It does kind of um, crop up again and again. I mean, I think. Um, I mean, it almost comes in at, at at a later stage because I mean, with with it for others. Um, I mean, really, like at its very germ, you know, as well as being a kind of an episodic film. The other thing that I, I was very keen to do was to, because with Bernadette, and then there was a film that I made after Bernadette called Make It New John, which is about, it's about the DeLorean car, but also about John DeLorean, the creator of the car. But I was very keen to not make a fil another film that had a person at the center of it. So, um, you know, the very germ of it for others was um, to make a film about objects. But then these things do um, come, come in again and again. Um, I mean, and actually, the the uh, the image of Joseph McCann, uh, the silhouetted image that appears in the Christmas stocking. I mean, that was a complete accident. It was um, I spent weeks like on eBay, get the in the previous section with all these kind of an anthropomorphic commodities, so bottles with faces and different packaging, and I was on this website and I found that, and it just kind of sat there, but. That you know, in relation to what you were saying about asking about the kind of process, that was it was never my intention that that would come in, but I couldn't leave it out at the same time. So, um, it's maybe more kind of subconscious um, preoccupation. These things keep keep coming in. Is there perhaps a last question from the audience? Uh, 
I was just going to ask, is there something to be said about um, the opening up of space that happens in, in the films? I'm just thinking some of the angles, the collaboration, say, with Michael Clarke, um, and that kind of that kind of different kind of perspectives that you get in those sections of the films, they kind of they kind of do something in terms of opening up the space and the bodies moving through it. Um, I just say saying how how did those collaborations come about? And in a way, is there the kind of when you look back at the originality of uh, Marca Rene, they also had these extraordinary mechanisms in the films that just opened up a different way of looking at things and. It feel, feels to me that certainly the, the kind of working with a choreographer like Michael Clark, that's sort of a similar thing that you were trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I, um, the, the section that, that Michael Clark choreographed originally it was going to be, um, it was just going to be a standalone piece, but um, we we kind of had this reading group between us where we were both reading Capital at the time and uh it like as the as the project developed it just seemed to be it's like the issues that we were kind of interested in um you know working on or or for him to think about how to choreograph um were so close to the film that it did end up becoming a section in the film but i mean the the that kind of god's eye perspective um came about it is sort of um in in michael's work like when you see it and perform in a theater there's always a section in the in the dance where the the dancers will kind of take to the ground and if you're sitting high enough up in the auditorium it kind of opens up this other perspective you know you have this other um like this whole other space on on the floor of the of the stage, but with the camera, it kind of allows you to extend that. So I mean, I think originally we didn't probably um, use it as much as we we we'd originally intended to, but um, you know, it, it's looking down on somebody's head. But as soon as they um, uh, take to the floor it's like this really kind of basic optical illusion it almost becomes um this gravity gravityless space um but and then also i think like in terms of um like what we were kind of interested in what we were both reading about at the time in terms of um like for example the idea of commodity fetishism and you know things not being as they appear, and one thing becoming another. Um, it seemed to really chime with that as well. Okay, we call this an evening with Duncan Campbell, and it has been one. Uh, I hope an interesting one, and sure one has. that was worth uh, spending here this evening. Uh, I thank you very much for staying, of course, and I thank uh, Art Basel for hosting this screening, and I just remind you that the uh, Festival del Film uh, Locarno will happen in August. This year is 5 from 15 of August, so I hope that after being here this evening, you will be with us again in Locarno. But thank you most of all to Duncan for being here and for the films. Thank you very much. Thank you.